So we discussed the instrumental variable uh, variables estimator, which is the ratio of the covariance, two covariances, covariance between the outcome and encouragement in the numerator, and then covariance between the treatment and um, denominator, uh, the encouragement in the denominator. Okay, and that was also the ratio of two ITT effects: ITT effect on the outcome, and ITT effects on the treatment uh, takeout. This test instrumental variables estimator is called the Ward estimator, whose um, the, the name is taken from uh, famous statistician Abraham Abraham Ward, uh, who came up with this estimator first. Okay. But you may also know this estimator as two-stage least squares estimator. So this is a standard way of calculating uh, this ratio of the covariances. It uh, turns out to be it's identical. So you can either just calculate the sample covariances and then compute the ratio or two ITT effects and compute the ratio, compute the ratio or do the following two stage least squares estimator. You first regress T on C and then obtain the fitted values, uh, the predicted values for TI. And then you regress the outcome on this fitted value and then take the coefficient. That coefficient is numerically identical to the ratio of the co two covariances or the ratio of the two ITT effects. Okay, uh, we can show that this uh, ID estimator, world estimator, is consistent, uh, converges to the compiler average streaming effect or ITT effect for compilers. Okay, and you can also um, figure out the asymptotic uh, variance using the delta method. The formula is a little bit complicated, but each of these terms uh, can be estimated from the data uh, consistently. Now let's discuss the application. So this application is taken from the 2016 paper. The settings is similar to one of the social pressure experiment that I discussed earlier. Uh, here the randomized encouragement was a uh, mailing of uh, encouraging voters to vote in the 2006 um, primary. The treatment here, um, since the authors are interested in uh, habitual voting, so the what's the impact of uh, voting being a habit, becoming a habit? Okay. So here the treatment is the turnout in the 2007 November uh, election. Okay. So in 2006 there was encouragement. The treatment is whether that person turned out in the 2007 election. And then the outcome is the turnout in the following election. So the idea is that if the turn uh, voting is a habit, then that could be operationalized as effect of voting in the previous election on the turnout of this election. So the idea is that holding everything else equal, um, voting in the previous election increases um, turnout probability of this election. So, and, and the, in fact, the authors looked at the subsequent elections uh, turnout as well, not just the 2008, but the um, later elections. And so that's a uh, really interesting way of thinking about what is the habit formation is. Uh, by uh, uh, estimating the effect of uh, previous turnout on the future turnout. Okay. And then using the uh, get out the vote campaign, the randomized get out the vote campaign as an instrument. So what's the assumption? Let's, um, what would happen if we apply the method that we discussed to this uh, uh, application, what does the uh, assumptions imply? So the monotonicity assumption here means that being contacted by a canvasser in 2006 primary would never discourage anyone from voting. So remember that monotonicity implies no defier. So the encouragement should not decrease the propensity to turn out. Okay. So there shouldn't be someone who would only vote if they're not contacted by a canvasser. Okay, so the canvasser would nev have never negative effect. So that seems um, reasonably, um, uh, it seems reasonable unless 
you think that um, canvassers somehow uh, upsets the voter and turn off their um, you know, uh, propensity to vote. The exclusion restriction is uh, interesting. Being contacted by a canvasser in this election has no effect on turnout in the next election other than through turnout in this election. Okay. So what that means is that uh, there's no other mechanism um, through which the encouragement influences the future election. Now this could be violated if, so suppose you are always um, taker. So always taker is someone who would always vote uh, in the election regardless of the contact. But still contact may have an impact on the future election turnout if that canvasser conversation with the canvasser actually um, raised the uh, awareness or interest in certain political issues that and then that led to in turn to the increase in turnout right um, and so if the encouragement uh, to vote have some impact on always takers or never takers then the exclusion restriction would be violated so uh, assuming these two critical assumptions hold um, then the instrumental variables estimate can be um, interpreted as a comprised average stream effect, um, but it's habitual voting for those who would vote if and only if they are contacted by a canvasser in this election. Right? So these are the people, these effects, the IV and RHS would only apply to the people who would vote uh, if uh, they are contacted by this canvasser. Um, it won't apply to the always takers and never takers. Uh, let's uh, estimate the proportion of principal strata first, and it turns out that proportion of compilers is about 8%, with some errors you know, of 0.3 percentage point. So it's a very small proportion. Um, only 8% of people are the ones who voted if they are contacted. Okay. Always takers, the people who always vote is about 30% and never takers is 60%. So the turnout is low, about 40%. So um, never takers is, is majority of uh, people uh, would not vote uh, regardless of the contact. So it's important to first estimate the proportion of the principal shot up to get a sense of, okay, for which, how big the population, how big a subpopulation of compilers for whom you are estimating the average stream effect. And uh, we can look at the downstream effect of turnout, and you see that um, it's uh, the compiled average uh, stream effect. So this is basically uh, what is the impact of voting in the uh, early election on turnout on, uh, in the current election. And you see the downward trend. So the uh, effects are declining, but still, um, um, you know, reasonable size uh, with just larger star errors. Uh, but you can sort of see that the um, the, the habit habit um, can have a last long uh, long lasting impact if uh, if those assumptions are hold. Uh, hold. Now let's uh, finally think about the violation of ID assumption. So it's it's always important to think about what would happen if the assumptions are violated. First, let's consider the case where exclusion restriction is violated. Then you can derive the bias of ID estimator. Bias is a function of two things. One is how big ITT effect for non-compiler is. Remember the exclusion restriction says this ITT effect for non-compilers is zero. And that, so the bias is of uh, that quantity times the relative proportion of non compilers So the larger the non compilers are, uh, the larger the bias. And the larger the ITT effect for non compilers the larger the bias. So that makes sense. Um, sometimes uh, what we call weak encouragement or weak instruments uh, is the case where the proportion of compilers is very small. So the instrument has uh, moves only small proportion of the people um, in a certain direction and when that happens the bias can be large because the denominator the proportion compiler is small for the second term so the second term gets larger okay. 
and if there is a direct effect of encouragement other than through the treatment, uh, then the first term uh, could be could be very large. Okay, so if there's an alternative causal path, or somehow the uh, encouraged group and non encouraged group aren't the same, then um, bias can be large. The second possibility we can think about is violation of the monochronicity. And again, we can derive the bias, and the bias has two terms. The second term uh, is, is a proportion of the fire. So how big the fire um, proportion is relative to the difference between the proportion of fire and the proportion of the fire. So if the proportion of the fire is as large as fire, then the second term would be, would be large. And then the first term is, again, depends on the IDT effect uh, for the defier. If that term is large, then um, the bias would be large. Okay, so it depends on the proportion of defiers and uh, how different causal effects are across um, between the variable uh, stream effect and the ITT effect for the defier. So let's go back to the habitual voting example. Um, as I said, the effect of voting in 2006 election on the turnout, um, it was a pretty big, right? So this is the um, it's a subsequent election and the effect size was quite sizable. The habit effect was 12.8 percentage point, um, but the potential bias of this uh, due to Exclusion restriction violation is also large. The reason why is that uh, comprier proportion is very small in this example, so 8.3%. And so the, the proportion of you know, non comprier relative to the proportion of comprier is like there's 11 times more non compliers than the compliers. So, whatever the direct effect. Um, uh, of the encouragement on non compliers are, it will be multiplied by 11. So the small uh, direct effect, small violation of exclusion, exclusion restriction can affect um, the uh, causal effect estimate quite a bit and can introduce the significant bias. Okay, to summarize the lecture, uh, we discussed the non compliance in randomized experiments. There's a very important difference between the intention to treat effect, which is easy to estimate just due to the difference in means between the encouraged and non encouraged group, versus what I uh, showed you the compiler average streaming effect. So, this is nice because it's average streaming effect, but it's only for compilers. Okay? But in order to get the second quantity, you need additional assumptions. And there are three assumptions that we have to uh, introduce one is the randomization of the instrument. That's uh, in the case of experiment, that's okay. Uh, that's satisfied. Uh, monotonicity, the, the encouragement affects everybody in one direction, no defier. And then the final exclusion restriction, the encouragement affects the outcome only through the treatment. Okay, so these three assumptions are necessary, required in order for you to estimate the comprier of its treatment effect, go beyond intention to treat analysis. Um, in the traditional instrumental variables, there wasn't distinction between compliers and non compliers. They just thought that the instrument was a magic bullet that solves the endogeneity. But as I showed you, even if the instrument uh, uh, satisfies the required assumptions, the quantity you get on, is only applicable to compliers. So this heterogeneity is very important. Unless they Average streaming effect for the compliers is the same as average streaming effect for non compliers. Uh, we cannot generalize the instrumental variables finding to the entire population. And remember that um, for non compliers, it's very difficult to estimate the average streaming effect because non compliers are the people where the instrument doesn't work. Right? They are either always, always takers, that they always take the treatment or never takers, never take the treatments. It's hard to estimate the counterfactual. Um, so this problem of external variety is important to recognize. Uh, the difference between compliers and non-compliers is always needs to be examined. And 
compliance uh, uh, depend on what instrument you use. But so different encouragement can induce different people into uh, compliers, uh, can turn different people into compliers. So if you're using a different instrument, even if the achievement, uh, the target achievement is the same, the estimates may be different uh, because uh, you're looking at the different uh, groups of people as compliers.